Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and we're going to talk about aggressive medication, medicating patients aggressively to lower diastolic blood pressure. Now I'm going to start at the beginning. Uh, I put out a couple of video clips and articles about the SPRINT trial which originally made headlines about a year and a half ago when researchers reported that aggressive lowering of systolic blood pressure, that's the top number, to less than 120 instead of the previous target of 140 to 150, <clears throat> excuse me, reduced the risk of heart disease and stroke so much that they had to stop the study earlier because it was unethical not to medicate the heck out of the rest of the patients, all right? So just a little information about SPRINT. It involved following 9,300 and some hypertensive patients for an average of 3.2 years, and they had some other factors like um, smoking, high cholesterol, kidney disease, and they were over the age of 75. Half were assigned to a group that established systolic blood pressure goal of below 140, and the other half were assigned to a group where the goal was 120 or lower. While this study was promoted as a landmark study, with cardiologists claiming it would change medical practice worldwide, the results were actually not very impressive. This is what we call a landmark study in the United States of America. There was a slightly greater than 1% reduction in deaths, slightly less than 1% lower incidence of heart failure, a half a percent decrease in events overall. Now, I think that's underwhelming, not overwhelming. 5% of the intervention patients had serious complications, which included blood pressure so low that it caused severe dizziness and fainting, electrolyte imbalances, and even damage to the kidneys. The incidence of serious complications in the control group was 2.5% as opposed to 5%, so twice as many serious side effects in the group that was aggressively medicated. Now, I'm not the only person that thinks this is insane. In an editorial in the Annals of Internal Medicine, two doctors wrote that most of the publicity about the results focused on benefits, nothing mentioned about the harms. And they listed even more harms. Those, their, their list included hypotension, electrolyte abnormalities, acute kidney injury, acute kidney failure, bra bradycardia, and injurious falls. The intervention group also had more frequent emergency room visits than the controls. And according to still another doctor, Dr. William Alderman, a thousand people would have to be medicated annually and treated aggressively in this manner for six people to avoid a heart attack, stroke, or heart failure. And then for every six people you help, you'd hurt 50. And so, again, I come back to this. In what universe is this a landmark study, right? Well, the bottom line from the SPRINT trial, lots of enthusiasm, not such great results. In fact, if, you, if the profession would universally adopt the recommendations, they would hurt more people than they would help, significantly more people than they would help. All right, so this brings us to the next point. As a follow-up to SPRINT, a research group at Johns Hopkins University decided to analyze data from over 11,000 patients that were enrolled in a different study. And um, the purpose of the study was to see if aggressive lowering of systolic blood pressure, which is the goal of the SPRINT trial, would result in significant lowering of diastolic blood pressure. And the $64,000 question is, would that then bring um, unwelcome results? Well, the results were really clear. Patients who were medicated to diastolic blood pressure lower than 60 were more than twice as likely to have damage to the heart muscle as those who had higher diastolic blood pressure ranging from 80 to 89. Those who were medicated to 60 to 69, 52 more uh, percent more likely to have damage to the heart muscle. The researchers also looked at the relationship between low diastolic blood pressure and coronary artery disease, uh, which is the buildup of plaque in the arteries. Again, the results, crystal clear. Patients with the lowest diastolic blood pressure, under 60, 49% more likely to have coronary artery disease and 32% more likely to die of any cause. The researchers stated that doctors should perhaps use a little bit more judgment in medicating patients and consider the implications of aggressively lowering diastolic blood pressure to such low levels. Well, the results of this study were based on something very common. We see this in a lot of different areas of medicine. It's called J-curve phenomenon, which says that when you over-treat patients, for anything, in this case hypertension, you can have worsened health outcomes, actually increasing the risk of bad things happen instead of decreasing the risks. So there's no question, by the way, some hypertensive, hypertensive patients patient, uh, benefit from medication. Some clearly should take medication, but my gosh, we medicate people who don't qualify. And the ones who do qualify, we medicate them too much. And uh, 
Clinical judgment is just gone from medicine these days. It's a very disturbing factor. So speaking of disturbing things, let's talk about how people can mislead, how doctors can mislead people. So I subscribe to um, an alternative medical journal. It's called the Townsend Letter. It's not peer reviewed. And some of the stuff in this particular publication can be very helpful. I've learned about things and tracked down things. Um, it's given me ideas for research and some of it is just dreadful. But it's read by a lot of people in the alternative health field. And so that's why I feel compelled to comment on this. So a recent article in the Townsend Journal featured the um, headline, Salad may cause autism. If Johns Hopkins says so, it must be true. Salad may cause autism. Did you hear that? The problem is that this is not at all what the researchers said at Johns Hopkins. So the article was written by a guy by the name of Andrew Saul, an editor of the Orthomolecular News Service. And the article starts with this sentence, if you believe the media, pregnant women should not eat leafy green vegetables. He goes on to say that according to researchers at Johns Hopkins, women who eat too much folate deliver children who have an increased risk of developing autism. Well, I went to the Johns Hopkins site and I read the report and here's what it said. Women who have very high levels of folate right after giving birth have babies who have double the risk of developing autism later. Um, women who have higher than normal maternal B12 levels uh, triple the risk that the child will develop autism. And when both levels, folate and B12, are, are excessively high, 17.6 uh, times higher rate of autism. The researchers note that, vi and I'm talking about the Johns Hopkins folks here, that folate is a B vitamin found in fruits and vegetables. The synthetic version, folic acid, is used to fortify foods and is a common ingredient in multivitamins. They also state that while the conventional wisdom is that one cannot consume too much folate or folic acid and the body will flush out the excess, this may not be the case with folic acid and B12. While recognizing that folate deficiency can cause birth, birth defects, the opposite is true. Excessive amounts can also cause problems. So to come up with this information, the researchers at Hopkins analyzed data from 1,391 mother-child pairs who were followed over a period of several years. The researchers were unable to determine why these women had such high levels of folate and B12, but most of them did report taking multivitamins during their pregnancy, so that could have been from a combination of multivitamins and consuming fortified foods. Another uh, contributing factor could have been predisposition to either increased absorption or slower excretion of both of these nutrients. And um, one research, the lead researcher said, quote, this research suggests that this could be a case of too much of a good thing. And that brings up a problem, and I'll come back to Saul's article in a minute here, but that brings up a problem, which is that um, the, the, there's a tendency to think in the nutrition field, if a little bit is a good idea, 25 times as much must be just fabulous, and that's not necessarily true. Now, there was no mention in the article about from the, from the Hopkins researchers about eating leafy green vegetables or even the you know, suggestion that eating excess vegetables was the cause, cause of the higher folate levels. And Saul, um, Dr. Saul actually admitted this in his article. He says, okay, the study targets supplements. But he then goes on to write about folate being an essential vitamin that must be consumed in food. He reports that folate intake is high in the diets of many animals like rabbits and elephants and asks where are all the autistic elements. But then these animals are not taking folic acid supplements and fortified bread. They're, they're eating plants. That's, that's, he, he doesn't differentiate. Now, as if to add to the insanity, Saul reports that he used to be a dairy farmer. And even though his pregnant cows ate large amounts of folate-rich grass, there was no autism in the cows. Same with the rabbits. He observed no autism in rabbits. And then he, again, fails to clarify that these animals were eating folate-rich food, not eating grasses and things like that, not eating supplements and fortified foods. Um, he then adds that he eats a lot of folate-rich foods and takes a high dose of B12. And I'm not sure what his personal habits or elephants and rabbits and cows have to do with any of this. But, um, I mean, it's just a ludicrous article, but, but it is so misleading. So it seems that basically what this guy did is cobble together an article where he misrepresents the findings of a research study done at Johns Hopkins. 
And then all of this is done in an attempt to reassure people that taking supplements is safe. And it's understandable because I went to his organization's website and he promotes the use of vitamin supplements based on biochemical individuality. And so he has a vested interest in promoting the use of supplements, but none of this makes this any less misleading. So shame on a publication like Townsend for publishing nonsense like this misleads the public. In fact, I'm sorry to tell you, but it misleads health professionals. You then start defending taking these supplements based on false claims and oh my gosh, goes on and on. All right, that's all for today and all for the week actually. So pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it and I will be back to you next week with more news.